Welcome everyone back to the Cafe Summer Series with the Pole Physio team. I'm joined again today by Danielle Davey. Welcome back, Danny. Hi, how are you going? Very good, thank you. Very good. So excited to have you back. Part you one too. was so wonderful, learning all about the feet and ankles, so uh, foot and ankles. So I'm just happy to um, have you back to learn about part two, which is going to be on the hip today. So uh, let's uh, let's yes. dive right into it. We'll sip our tea and uh, and all things hip. <laughs> Perfect. Hip Love flexors that. specifically. We're going to do hip flexors today, which was by request. Yes, it was by request, which we're excited about. Mm. The hip's pretty complex. There's a lot going on around the hip. And I know that this isn't another area of your um, your interests and passions as a physio, which is exciting. Um, so why don't you start by telling me, well, telling everyone, not just me, um, a little bit about the hip flexors, why maybe they were requested and um, what we're going to be talking about exactly today. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I honestly, I didn't ask why they were, were requested, but we do get a lot of people uh, talking about their hip flexors and it's often a, a little bit of a controversial topic. Like people either love their hip flexors or they hate them with passion. Um, so I actually have a few friends who sometimes used to say to me that they would love to just take their hip flexors out, <laughs> remove them all together. Um, <laughs> horrible, horrible idea. Please don't do that, people. <laughs> These are pole dancer friends. They are pole dancer friends. What? I know. And I really hope that they're watching this and they can laugh at themselves um, at the fact that I told that story. Um, yes, you're welcome. You know who you are. <laughs> um, but I think that sometimes uh, as pole dancers, we get a, we kind of get a bit annoyed at our hip flexors sometimes, don't we? So they're often, they feel really tight and we think, oh, I just want to get my splits and I need my hip flexors to loosen up so that I can you know, slide out into that beautiful front split. Um, and we sometimes feel like they're holding us back. So yes, sometimes hip flex is not always loved. Yes. Sadly, um, sadly. It is sad. And I've seen many of my patients as well. They just, uh, there's definitely a, um, maybe so, more so my patients as opposed to your friends. There's a bit more of a love hate relationship. They love the fact that they've got hip flexes, but they hate the fact that they're not doing what they want them to do. Yeah. Um, they, in their words, always feel tight. Like no matter how much always feel they tight, do, always feel tight. So I think that there's yes. probably some people at home watching this that could probably relate to that. I imagine. Yep. So, yeah, definitely. So yeah. we might as well start with that, right? Yes, so why do our hip flexors always feel tight? Like people are, <laughs> people get really frustrated by this, don't they? Um, so this is this is often the case anywhere in the body, not just the hip flexors. But a tight feeling muscle is a not always tight and B if it's tight it's usually tight for a reason so rather than being tight and needing to stretch the you know the living daylights out of them really probably what our hip flexors need if they're telling us that they feel tight they are usually overworked and fatigued yep so they they either we're asking them to do way too much and they just need a break or they're not strong enough really for what we're asking them to do. So we ask our hip flexors to do a lot more as polars and aerialists than the average everyday person is going to ask their hip flexors to ever do. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they're under much greater load. So basically for any, any area of the body, particularly our muscles, um, if we don't have the capacity in that tissue to achieve what we're asking it to do, then it's going to either get really fatigued or get tight as a compensation strategy, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's when it's it's giving us that sensation that it's tight and it wants to be stretched. But what it's really telling us is it, it needs a break and it needs some strength, it needs yeah. some love. So basically the hip flexors get tight to protect us. They're trying to basically right. say that if you keep on pushing me too much, something bad's going to happen. So yeah. they're going to just tighten up and no matter how much stretching you do, it's just going to continue to tighten up or stay tight or this feeling of tightness. Whether it actually yeah. is tight or not is to beg to differ. So a lot of hip flexors in pole dancers aren't actually tight. They maybe right. have a sensation of tight, but when we go to assess them, very, very few pole dancers actually have tight hip flexors. So very, very true. Yeah. So before you start blaming tight hip flexors as the, as the issue, maybe you can uh, test the length of your hip flexors, which we won't show today. That's something that we can um, maybe do um, in our, well, we definitely can do in our sessions, our online appointments, but we can test the length of our hip flexors 
but we can also test the strength of our hip flexors, which is something we're going to do today. So if you're weak in your hip flexors, it's probably the issue, not the, not the length of the hip flexor itself. Yeah, that's definitely true. And our hip flexors often tell us, they give us the sensation of feeling tight as well if they're overstretched. So if you're stretching them all day, every day, well, they aren't going to enjoy that and they're going to tell you that they feel tight, but it's really because you're loading them um, in a way that they may not really love. Yeah, it's the stretch reflex. If you lengthen a muscle and it's not strong enough to handle that load of that position, it will tighten back up or it'll give you that sensation of a tight muscle. Mm. So really mm. important to know. Um, the other thing I have found is um, with hip flexors, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this, is um, the lifting the legs into inverts, um, so like straddles and shoulder mounts. Um, a lot of people really struggle with that. Um, so whether it's aerial in, in the air or whether people like literally trying to do a leg lift on the floor and they're like, why can't I lift my leg? Yeah. <laughs> horrible drills that our instructors make us sit, uh, do. <laughs> and they can like, they get some pretty gross sensations um, sometimes like you, those quad cramps. Mm -hmm. Is that what's going on there? <laughs> yeah. So there's a few sensations that can pop up if our, if our biomechanics, including our hip flexors are not quite spot on. Mm. Um, so you can get the sensation of the quad cramping, especially if you're trying to invert with straight legs mm. um, and your hip flexors aren't really doing their job. But also if we backtrack and go back to some of the more central anatomy, Really, our hip flexors, um, if we're talking about hip flexors, we're often, as physios, we're talking about the two main components of our deep hip flexors, right? So this is what we're looking at strengthening today in our exercises. So we're looking at iliacus and psoas major, um, which kind of insert together and combine, uh, inserting down onto the femur, the thigh bone, as one central tendon. So we often talk about them as being iliopsoas. Yeah. Cool. Do you have, I think I remember you saying that you have a pelvis. At your I do. Look, I have my hand, my handy pelvis. Right. So for those who don't know muscle anatomy, whereabouts is iliacus sitting? On? So iliacus actually attaches from this inside rim of the front of the pelvis. It's quite a broad sort of uh, muscle attachment there. Comes down in through the front of the hip, through the groin and attaches down here lower onto the femur. Right. So that's iliacus. That's that half. Um, the psoas major half actually attaches to your lumbar spine. So your lower back onto your vertebrae. Um, and I think a lot of people don't really realize this unless they've studied anatomy um, that for not so much, uh, if we take pole dancing out of the equation, if we go back to regular human function, um, that psoas major is actually a primary spinal stabilizer yes. um, for walking and for everyday kind of actions. Yeah, so it has a dual role, um, flexing the hip, so bringing the knee up towards your abdomen or your chest, as well as stabilizing that lumbar spine. So if I stand up, so on me, so so this comes all the way from the back, but not this part of my back, but deep, deep. A little bit on the internal side, yeah. So deep inside and then crosses the body at the front and then runs down that same pathway and mm. joins into where iliacus is, um, is going to then insert onto the thigh bone. So it's, I think it's the only muscle that actually crosses our body in terms of that direction. I might be wrong there, but I believe back it's to the front. Muscle. Yeah, back to front. So it's, um, well, that goes from literally one side to the other side. So it has a really interesting role when it comes to stability. So, mm. yeah, so I think. Yes, Absolutely. Very important muscle. So understanding the anatomy is pretty key here when it comes to uh, hip flexors. Yeah. So um, talk to me a little bit more then about the biomechanics of the body and um, the hip flexors. So what's kind of the next step that we need to know now that we kind of know where our hip flexors are? Yeah, what we're looking at. <laughs> what are the other hip flexors? Sorry. What are, because there are. Yeah, so we do have other hip flexors as well. Other, other muscles that can assist in helping to flex the hip. And they're probably more what I would call accessory hip stabilizers or accessory hip flexors. Um, so they're definitely always helping us. We don't, we don't want to ditch them or, you know, take them away either, <laughs> um, but they're, they it shouldn't be their primary. They shouldn't be the primary muscle lifting the leg. So our quad muscles help us to lift our leg, mm -hmm. um, as well as our TFL, which is the nuggety little extra muscle on the outside slash front of the hip right in there. Yep. <laughs> 
um, as well as pectineus, one of our adductor inner thigh muscles. It's in through, yeah. the, partly set on my pants, but deep through the front of the hip. Yeah. <laughs> deep through the front of the hip, yeah. So there's yeah. a few other muscles in there that help us to lift our leg or flex our hip. Um, but really, when we're thinking from a pole dancing perspective, we want to be, our function is then quite different when we're thinking about inverting, say, compared to what an everyday human walking on the ground is going to be using these muscles for. Um, so when we're thinking about training hip flexors or using our hip flexors, um, when we're standing walking on the ground, the point that we're using those muscles from is the ground. So we've got this nice stable surface under us that we can then build our muscle function up from there. It's a little bit more straightforward than once we're polling, we're holding on to something up here. So our stable base, if we're talking about inverting specifically, is up here. So we're working those muscles in the opposite direction. So we need that stability to start with the shoulders and the trunk, right? Yes. Yeah. Rather than from the ground. So um, we need to actually actively stabilize ourselves quite a bit more for our hip flexors to be able to then work um, as we would like to lift the leg. Yes. So. In essence, what does that come down to then? It comes down to spinal stability. So your core. Yeah. So if you don't have good whole 360 degree core function right around your, your abdomen or your torso, then your hip flexors, since they attach to the spine and the pelvis, are then going to have to kick in to help stabilize. So then they're already working pretty hard. They're going to find it a lot more difficult to activate, to lift your leg for you, to invert. So then all of those accessory muscles we talked about further down the chain, so those quads and the pectineus and the TFL, they're then going to have to kick in to work a lot harder to help you lift your leg. Yep. And we also want them to straighten our knee if we're doing some straight leg inverts. So it kind of just snowballs. It all just gets a lot harder from there, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think um, it's not, it, it, this is, we're talking about it a little bit black and white. It's a very nuanced sort of. Um, oh, sort of, it is. <laughs> so, so yes, we need our quads to flex our hip. They have to still work. Yeah. The hips. yeah. Uh, we need our TFL to help flex our hip and we need our pectineus to flex our hip. So please, no one watching this think that we just only use iliocellus to flex our hip. Correct. That's, that's not the case at all. Yes. Quads will definitely help out, but we don't want the quads to be the primary thing that flexes our hips when we go into an invert. Our hip flexors being iliopsoas primarily should be the ones that are doing most of the work. Quads are there to assist to a certain degree, but when you're doing a straight leg invert, your quads should be really focused on keeping the knee straight and less so focused on flexing through the hip. And so if mm. your forehead trunk's not doing the work correctly, hip flexus iliopsoas needs to then help that out, which means it's focusing less on flexing the hip, which means then the quads start to compensate for iliopsoas. And, and then what happens? We bend the knee. because We bend the knee no. because there's nothing left. There's nothing left. <laughs> we're starting to struggle. Either that or we end up with those horrible quad cramps. Well, They're crazy. awful, right? All the shakes. All the shakes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. I've seen so many polars recently. Some of my gorgeous patients, but also polars just doing like straight leg inverts and they're not quite straight, but you can see them midair. They're like, yeah, trying so, so hard. so hard. I'm like, there's it's definitely. Core muscles. They're giving it a good go. Yeah. yeah. So we need yeah. our abs to work in harmony with our hip flexors so mm. our core to work in harmony I should say with our hip flexors um to each do their own individual jobs but together they need to kind of work as a team they I do like because every movement that we do pole especially but everyday life even everything is a whole body movement yeah. you don't get to just put aside a few muscles and joints and say I don't need that for this I'm just going to pick and choose what muscles to turn on every movement everything needs to work as a team so what you're saying is don't cut out your hip flexors? I mean, probably not. <laughs> not today. Not today. Sorry, Danny's mates. We're, we're not cutting out the hip flexors today. Uh, yep. <laughs> I think that you have made that so simple for people to understand in a beautiful way and not, not, not in too simplistic. I think it just makes perfect sense. And I think a lot of people are going to appreciate that. Then I think the next question for them will be like, how do we make these things actually work? Okay. So now we yeah, know yeah. You need the abs to do their role and the hip flexors to do their role. So I keep on just calling your so as hip flexors and I keep using them interchangeably. Again, we do have other hip flexors out there um, and we need the quads to do its main role. So um, I'm going to, 
jump the uh, not the jump the gun but jump forward a little bit and say how do we do that usually a lot how of do we do rehabilitation that? usually a lot of tailored rehab so if anyone out there who's having a lot of issues with their hip flexors please mm -hmm. remember that Danny's now accepting online patients through the pole physio online booking system so she can definitely help you out I'll be able to help you out in a few months a time when I'm back from <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm on annual leave at the moment, still working. She's not um, here. Not treating patients at the moment. Um, and Jake <laughs> is also a, a, available to take on patients as well. So we'll talk more about that later. Um, but we've got some exercises, or I should say Danny's put together some exercises for you all today to help you get Yeah, started. I've um, got a few to help you get started. Um, but when we're talking about uh, doing this, so we're starting today with our baseline iliopsoas exercises so we're trying in these exercises to really isolate that iliopsoas for those of us who maybe don't have um, amazing strength in those or isolated control of those to put it then together into that whole body system so in these exercises the most important thing is that we're starting with a neutral spine and pelvis position for all three of these exercises that we're going to do today and that does not mean that you're always going to train your hip flexors or your abdominal muscles or anything else always in neutral. I mean, we need to tuck the hips under and, and flex through the lower back to invert, right? For a start um, to do all of our basic pole moves. So <laughs> but we've got to start somewhere. Yeah, I was going to say, let's explain neutral. I'll be your um, yes again, because I think that's probably a, a nice way for people to see. So yeah. well, let's talk through what neutral is for people who don't understand how. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yes. So a neutral spinal position, it's not um, exactly straight, right? If we're looking side on. So thankfully, Simone has some, some great um, shaped curves there. Some of us have more or less. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Our beautiful model. Yes. Some great shaped spinal curves as well. <laughs> so we're looking at, we should have three separate curves in our spine, right? So we should have um, like a little valley or a hollow in the neck and the lower back. Yep. So these are called uh, a lordosis, that little hollow shape. And then in the upper back, we should have the reverse, what we call a kyphosis, um, which is the, the hill shape. Yeah. Yeah. The rounding shape. Yeah. So we should have three nice smooth curves through the spine naturally. So if we're looking at doing any, um, any core work or any hip flexor work in neutral, we don't want to smoosh the lower back flat. Yeah, we want to keep that curve. So if Simone tucks right under here, she's <laughs> now got not really any lower back curve. And the reason that this is a problem when we're looking at baseline hip flexor work is, is because it's really hard to use your hip flexors through here, right? So if I turn <laughs> all this in and then try to use my hip flexors, I feel like How does it go? stomping around the ground like I feel like I can't actually lift my hip out forwards I feel like I have to lift it, lift it to the side and use all my outside muscles to actually oh yeah it's so incredibly difficult and and part of that is the the length tension relationship we've just put our hip flexors at because we've actually flexed the hip as well by doing this just a little just a little yeah. potentially depending on what you're doing with your knees um or you've taken into extension depending on what you've done with your knees so we've kind of wiped out neutral in the hip as well um, but on top of that, we've not got 360 degrees around the abdomen and the lower back of core stability. Now we're really over overworking the abs in the front yeah. and the lower, the deep lower back muscles at the back have, have sort of been, you know, they've had a holiday. They've been wiped out. Yeah, they? They're <laughs> so we're like lacking that spinal stability there at the back, which means that we've got to get that spinal stability from somewhere. So we've got our abs at the front. Yes. That other than that, we're already now going to be using that so as major muscle to stabilize the spine, yeah. which is what we talked about before, right? So if it's already busy doing something else, it's going to have a lot more trouble than lifting your leg and flexing your hip. Yeah. So we also don't want to go the other way. Can we show a hyperlordosis? So an arched lower back. So now we really have gone into hip flexion, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the sticking your bum out position. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you're only yeah. in the cafe series is me twer my, my twerking in the cafe. <laughs> Lucky we're not in a in a really in public cafe. I know. Well, I mean, there'd that'd be was, riots. That'd be great. Imagine that. <laughs> Jake hates the cafes in Melbourne or Sydney. You also look like you're standing on your chair there. So you're standing on your chair in the yeah. cafe twerking. Party on the chair. Twerking. Party on the well, it is. You know, it is new. <laughs> it is the new year. 
Yes, exactly. And the same to be celebrating still. <laughs> yeah, just celebrated 2023, turning year. So who knows? Could be still going. It could <laughs> be still going. <laughs> still, so I'm in my hyper. So if we're coming into that hyperlordotic for that that increased uh, lower back curve position, we've then instead lost our our core stability through the front, right? And we're overactivating at the back. Yeah. So I feel in this position, I just don't feel much happening through my stomach. It's all stretched out. But my lower back feels super, super cramped. Like all the muscles are just working really, really hard to hold that position and like that yeah. work. So if I go back to leg now, <laughs> I oh, it's hard. It's hard. I don't quite feel like T Rex, whereas before I was like a monster. I feel like the opposite of T Rex, whatever this is. <laughs> so it's not if they're not working for me, great either way. <laughs> so these yeah. Are so obviously we're over exaggerating these things right now, right? But. In essence, it, it just shows you if you haven't got that ideal neutral kind of roughly neutral uh, position, it's going to be harder for you to start to work on your hip flexors. Later on, when you get stronger, absolutely go for gold, try and train them in all possible positions, because later on in the poll, we're probably going to be asked to use them in lots of different positions, right? Yes. But it's harder. It's harder. Absolutely. So to find neutral, um, I think you've got a special trick for this one. I have a lovely trick. Yes. So you're going to make a diamond shape with your hands for me and pop it on the front of your pelvis. Yeah. So this is much better than looking um, side on at your lower back curve because everyone, and I say this in the uh, nicest way possible, everyone has a different shaped butt, right? Some of us have a little bit less glute muscle and some of us have a uh, big bubble butt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Which I love. The, no yeah. judgment either way. Um, but it's a lot harder to tell where neutral is by looking at your lower back for that reason because it kind of puts us off. So if we pop the hands on the front of the pelvis there and then you turn side on for us again, um, a, a neutral position in standing is, hor is, is vertical. Sorry, not horizontal. Don't yeah. go horizontal. Um, is vertical with your hands there. So you can try tilting forwards and back and you'll find that your hands then also obviously tilt forwards and back. So you don't want that plane of your hands tilting back towards your face because then you're too tucked under. And also if they're then tipped down, pointing towards the floor, then you're probably a little bit too arched. Yeah. Yep. So roughly neutral is roughly vertical there at the front of the pelvis. Okay. Yeah. Getting cut out parts, maybe because I'm standing a bit further away, that might help. Okay, so that there is a neutral position. So basically. Yeah, so we should still see then a little bit of a lower back curve and we can get that whole core engagement, the whole 360 degrees around that abdomen and lumbar spine. Yeah, so I was going to say for those of you who are aware of pelvic positions and tilts and what we call them, that position there, that hyperlidosis position is called an anterior pelvic tilt. And then we take it the other way. That's called a posterior pelvic tilt. Just for those who need to go, okay, so I need to take it not too excessive into posterior, not too much into anterior, kind of just going to find that middle ground. There. Yeah, that neutral pelvic posture as well as the neutral spinal posture. I can lift my legs easy. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> not with pointed toes at the moment, but it's going to fall off, but you got the idea. So we Perfect. work on strengthening our hips in a neutral position first. And then when we're in positions on the pole, when we're a bit more advanced, so like you've smashed through your beginners and intermediates and you're working on something a bit more challenging, like your aerial shoulder mats, for example, you're taking it from a Superman position. It takes you into that anterior pelvic tilt and we need our hip flexors to obviously work to help us lift the legs, which means we need some strength in no longer our neutral position, but we need to start taking the, uh, the building the strength into extremes of range of motion. So into anterior tilt and posterior tilt. But what Danny's trying to get at by the sound of it is that we need to start by strengthening in a neutral position and then build outwards. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to we be can get that whole body coordination and function first before we take it into those more difficult ranges. Yes. Amazing. Okay. So now that we've got a full understanding of what <laughs> neutral posterior anterior pelvic tilt is, Shall we get into the first exercise? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let me um, so the first one that we're going to try out today, feel free to all try it at home, is in four-point kneeling. So you're going to need a long band, a power band, or a, a, medium, a medium sort of strength TheraBand. And I'm going to pop it around something tied on. And it goes just above my knee. So I'm coming into this nice standard four-point kneeling position. And finding my neutral spine and pelvis. So I did a couple of tucks and tilts under. 
And I'm going to use this ball here, this Pilates ball. You can use um, anything that you've got at home, really. Um, soft toys work really, really well, actually. Maybe and not. And that's going. Hmm? No, I was going to say maybe not small children, but soft toys are great. No, yeah. Don't put your small child. That <laughs> probably won't be good because you'll, you'll see why in a minute. That's yeah. not ideal. <laughs> Um, so in essence, the, the exercise is very simple. All I'm doing is bending the knee up towards my chest and then letting it go back. And I'm going to do a really bad one here. <laughs> so I want that pelvis to ideally stay in neutral so that I'm trying as much as I can to isolate my hip flexor to strengthen. So if I overuse my abdominal muscles at the front of my core, then I'm going to tuck under rounding out my lumbar spine and the ball or whatever you've got on your butt is going to fall off the back. Mm -hmm. If I cheat and tilt sideways, it's going to fall off the side. So that's the purpose of, of whatever's sitting on your butt there. Um, it's just to tell you if you're cheating or not so that we can get some ideal form. So hopefully now I'm going to do an ideal one. So I'm in neutral position with some abdominal engagement at the front there. And I'm just moving that knee straight forwards and back. And at the moment, I'm doing a fairly small range of motion. So I'm just doing that mid-range because it's the easiest place to get a good quality engagement in. Mm -hmm. So I can really get into some nice strengthening there. So I was going to say, you're basically isolating the hip flexors at the moment away from pretty much all the other muscles there. So teaching you how to use hip flexors without recruiting quads. So, sorry, teaching you how to use iliopsoas without recruiting quads and abs. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And it's not that those things, as we said earlier, aren't going to be working at all, but the things that are producing the movement is mainly that iliopsoas. So, so our body is kind of learning that everything else can stabilize while the iliopsoas is that primary mover. So not over-recruiting is probably the better word I should have used then. Yeah. 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 So to progress this, would you move yourself in a like away from where the band is being anchored to, to make the... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Get a bit more resistance from your band. Yep, definitely. Um, and the other way that I commonly like to progress this is to also start going through a greater range of motion. Whoop, there goes my ball again. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can start to, if you tie it a little bit, uh, loop it around your, your thigh a couple of times there. Um, make it a bit more secure. You can also take the, the leg further in front of you and then further out the back so that you're working that, um, that iliopsoas complex through a greater range of motion. So you're starting to use it a little bit more um, as you might end up using it on the pole. Um, just making sure um, that as we're coming up into those higher ranges of flexion, so the knee closer to the chest, we don't want to be feeling any, um, any feelings of compression or pinching in the front of the hip. Um, so the average, <laughs> I say in quotation marks, um, the average amount of hip flexion range of motion that uh, most people supposedly have is like 130 to 135 degrees maybe. And pole dancers often have a bit more range of motion than the average human. Um, but really, if we're doing this with a neutral spine, we shouldn't be able to get the knee all the way into the chest probably yeah. and just without doing something else. <laughs> Just to clarify that 130, 135 degrees is with a bent knee. So mm, that's yes. what's considered the normal population. So like your mum, dad, brother, sister, et cetera, should have approximately 130-ish degrees of hip flexion with a bent knee. Mm. That's what's considered normal versus um, as pole dancers, we're obviously a little bit special um, in the <laughs> way possible. <laughs> yeah. I said to you the other day where... Um, and this goes for all pole dancers when you're as soon as you uh, join the pole dancing world where now you're now part of the abnormal population where a, yes. a bunch of weirdos apparently according to healthcare professionals out there because we don't work within the norms so welcome to the club of weirdos for everyone else out there who's just become <laughs> a pole dancer because we're apparently abnormal <laughs> love it <laughs> love it that's all right if um if uh, being a pole dancer makes us abnormal, I never want to be normal again. Let's put it. Oh out. no! Yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, so that's a great uh, motor control exercise to start to work on isolating um, uh, iliopsoas and, and building on that, um, or strengthening it from a motor control point of view. So then I think you've got the the next one's kind of taking it a little bit. Um, I guess yeah. 
Yeah. So the next one, the next one is a straight leg raise. And this is one that we commonly see used in flex classes or in uh, pole warm ups. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one that's uh, sadly frequently done a bit uh, suboptimally. <laughs> And a lot of people often get some clicking and catching in the front of the hip while they're doing this as well. So it's not very comfortable sometimes. So I'm going to give you a regression to try first. So lying on our back with our knees bent, finding that neutral pelvis and spine again. So this time our hands will be horizontal. So I don't want to be squishing my lower back into the floor because then again, I'm overusing the abdominal muscles um, rather than the entire core. And all I'm doing is thinking about lifting one knee, but making sure with my hands on my pelvis there that my pelvis is not moving. So I'm flexing, I'm isolating that flexion movement at the hip. And I'm going to do a couple of bad ones here. So where I'm rotating my pelvis to the side, we can also cheat by squashing the lower back into the floor and tucking the pelvis under or overarching, which you'll see in a minute. Um, but here's the progression. So as you get better and better at this, you can start to take that leg further away. So now rather than just trying to isolate as much as we can, that iliopsoas, oh, the dog, <laughs> saying hi. hi um, so as I start to straighten out that leg, I start to involve more and more quad activation. And then I have to use those quads, obviously, to keep the knee straight. So they're taking on their dual role, um, which is really, really helpful for us for on the pole. Oh, and here comes my cheats. So as I'm kicking, I'm either tucking under or you can see some daylight under my lower back there. Um, so this is a non-optimal movement pattern that we often kind of just throw our leg into, particularly during our warm up if we're not focusing too much. Um, but if we want to get the most out of this exercise, we want to be holding that pelvis in a fairly neutral position. So we can really think about pulling the femur the thigh bone and the hip down into the floor. So we're getting that really nice hip flexor, iliopsoas kind of contraction there. Mm. So practicing good movement patterns that we're going to use to invert probably later in our class. Yes, absolutely. There was one that, yeah, you're talking and there we go, Jack's moved past. So I think it's this one here. That was a cheat, um, by the way, for anyone who's watching and when we're mm. seeing Danny lift her butt off the ground and really tense through her abs and she doesn't look like she's breathing. It's all like really hard work. That's um, such that's cheating. Yes. And I'm also using my other leg that's on the ground. Yes, to push into so, the stabilize. Yeah, yes. yeah. So really. another nice way to progress this, if you're doing okay with it, is actually to do it with both legs out flat on the ground. So you're only lifting one leg um, at this stage, but yeah, taking that other leg out of the equation so you can't use it to stabilize. You have to use your core to stabilize. Yeah, right. Okay. So that's that exercise there. That's a goodie. I'm liking it. Um, so I think there was one more that you had. Yeah, one last one. So this exercise, while Sim brings it up, is um, I've, I've commandeered it from uh, the wonderful Alison Grimaldi, who's an amazing um, hip physio. Mm. So it looks like not very much, but if you give it a go, trust me, you will feel it. <laughs> um, can confirm. <laughs> so I'm finding again that neutral spine and pelvis position. So I'm not flattening my lower back into the wall, but I do want that nice abdominal engagement through the front at the same time. So I'm bringing, I'm flexing my hip, bringing the knee up to horizontal, thinking about pulling that hip in towards the wall to really get that deep hip flexor contraction. And then we're adding the layer of the quads on top. So I'm thinking about gently extending through the knee. It doesn't have to go all the way straight, um, but just extending it out in front of me and then bending it again. So we're essentially uh, getting that quad muscle to change its role from helping us a little bit with our hip flexion, but hopefully not too much, to now it has to activate to straighten the leg like we'll want it to do on the pole when we go for straight leg inverts and that kind of thing. Um, so definitely lots of cheats that we see here. So dropping the knee as we straighten the leg means that probably I've been using my quad too much as a hip flexor. So this is a really nice way to help our active, um, our active mobility as well. Um, that cheat that you just saw there as well was flattening my lower back into the wall. So I'm using my abdominal muscles too much to lift the leg in the air rather than actually flexing at the hip. 
and I can also be hitching the hip up to the side. So you can cheat in pretty much any uh, any plane of motion <laughs> for this and exercise. It won't usually that look that obvious, like what you just did in terms of the hip hitch. <laughs> It'll usually no, be a bit subtle. <laughs> it'll be a bit more subtle, yeah. So you'll yeah. probably need a mirror or to film yourself to be able to to catch that one. Yeah. And it's a good one to film front on and side on because you'll get a bit mm. more out of it. Um, I'm just trying to find the one that you're talking about here where you were tucking your tummy into the wall. Yeah. That's a- so if I tuck into the wall there, can you all see that? There's yeah. no daylight. My lower back is rounding and, and even the abdominal engagement in the front just doesn't look ideal, does it? you are kind You've of got that kind of, out. yeah, that kind of bracing out look where the tummy actually protrudes out rather than gently draws in. Yeah. Um, and you might notice if you're looking really closely that I actually purse my lips at the same time. Yes, you so, did. yeah. So using my tongue and my jaw and actually bracing through my diaphragm to cheat some core stability. See that your- diaphragm is part of our core as well. Yeah. I can see your neck also working there trying to stabilize. There's so much happening. Yeah. So, so much. much happening. So yeah. it's actually a really complicated exercise for one that looks like you're really not doing very much at all. No, and I was going to say, this is one that's usually included a lot in uh, warm-ups of classes, but not to this degree where it's against the wall and you're really thinking about the control. It's usually um, brought into warm-ups with like a leg swing, so like the full leg just moving forwards and backwards. Um, Or I've definitely seen, and certainly we do it in our classes, where we stand hands on hips or hands in the air and we're bending and straightening the knee. So it's basically the same exercise without the wall, but in class there's no real thought process in terms of, okay, let's draw the hip into the or the thigh into the socket or hip into the socket and think about utilizing hip flexor to lift the leg and then the quad so I think it's a nice one um, it's an easy one in quotation marks to bring into classes not easy to do yeah easy one to actually bring into classes and actually then get some pretty efficient gains from it you know and you can absolutely do this just leaning against the pole it doesn't have to be a wall Um, But that wall or pole there is just um, to give you, A, a a little bit of stability. You don't have to worry so much about your balance. Um, You can focus on what you're actually trying to get out of the exercise. Um, But B, then you can kind of feel what your back is doing against the pole. So you know if you're starting to round out through your lower back. Mm -hmm. I can pretty much guarantee if you haven't done it against the wall and you just do it standing in the middle of the room or next to your pole holding on, you're probably going to be rounding your lower back and overusing the abdominal muscle to to cheat lifting the leg so you're not actually flexing the hip you're flexing your lower back as well oh yeah I see that so much uh, and certainly mm. with the leg swing um so when we're doing warm-ups we see so much happening through the lower back as opposed to the actual hip and look if that's the purpose of the exercise in warm-up is to move the lower yeah. back and like it's a mobility exercise as opposed to a strengthening exercise fine not a problem but if the goal is to strengthen your hip flexors yeah so it really depends what you're trying to get out of your exercise doesn't it I mean um, yeah if you're also looking to warm up your hamstrings and get some good active mobility in the hamstrings not the entire back half of you then you really want to be still isolating this at the hip because the hamstrings attach onto the pelvis right so if I'm tucking the pelvis under I've actually lost part of that hamstring mobility anyway so yeah kind of avoided it (laughs) We could talk about this for days. The hips oh, we could. at the start. It can be quite complex, but doesn't have to be complex. We can decomplify it, de demystify it. I don't know. I'm making up my Justify it. Let's go with that. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long day, people, and I'm like I said on annual leave, so my brain's a whole. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, yeah, let let Danny demystify it for you, and she can help you out. That's for sure. So, Danny, what are your takeaway messages for today? What would you like everyone to, if they can remember one thing about today, what would it be? Look, I think you hip flexors, if you know how to to train them well and to use them well, they can be your absolute best friend. Um, so don't don't wish them away or want to take them out or stretch the living daylights out of them. Um, if you strengthen them and you strengthen them well in conjunction with the whole rest of the body, they can make your pole life a whole lot easier. Absolutely. Preach. They don't have to be the love-hate relationship. We can just love them. Yeah. <laughs> we can learn to love our hip flexors, everyone. Goals. <laughs> so <just> absolute goals. <laughs> that sounds so corny, but it's true. We don't have to be hating on our hip flexors always. No. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed today's session. Thanks, Danny, for bringing us all this information. I think it's a great foundation for a lot of people to 
begin their knowledge to learning how to love their hip flexors again. Um, the one thing we obviously didn't talk about is injuries. There's so much we could go into, so we're not going to go into that too much. The probably thoughts a lot of people might be having is for those who have clunking, popping, catching hips, the hip flexor may be one of those things that's contributing to that. With the right tailored rehab, you can actually address that. Um, and it's usually a sign of dysfunction around that hip, pelvis, lower back and core mm. area. So, And it might be a little bit different for everyone. So if you've got a mate who's gone and seen a physio and has a rehab program for it, it might not be the same one that we would give you as well because the hip is quite a complex, you know, it's a 360 degree ball and socket joint. There's, um, there's a lot of different things that can be happening. Yeah. All my patients will know I really dislike recipe treatments. Um, oh, yeah. And that's why I never encourage anyone to Google anything in terms of medical <laughs> advice or injuries. Um, it can guarantee you it's going to lead you down a very dark path. Um, so for anyone out there who's watching who has a clicking, popping hip, an injury, or has goals, and I think ho hopefully everyone has goals out there, but their goals maybe include um, some strengthening of the hip flexor region, trying to specifically get their straight leg straddles, inverts, um, shoulder mounts, deadlifts, straight leg fan kick even. like whatever. Oh, yeah. And you're yeah. Really struggling with it. See Danny, because I can assure you, and I'm not just saying this, I can assure you that Danny will get you your straight leg version of any of those <laughs> a lot quicker, like a considerable, like a fraction of the time than what you would by yourself trying to work it. And I've seen many people struggle, struggle with it for years. Even elite people struggle trying to get their straight leg version of things for years because they're like, I should just be able to fix this with strengthening. And it's just not the case. You need individual tailored assessment and rehab for those sort of things if they're not coming along in a, in a timely manner. So if anyone out there who's watching that you've been trying and trying to get your straight lines and it's not coming along, Touch base with Danny because she's amazing and will be able to help you out there. But definitely for anyone who's watching with any injuries of the hip, see Danny straight away. <laughs> Get in and see her. Um, and I've, I said before as well, Jake is available. Jake's just as wonderful and a great therapist. So absolutely book in and see either of these two. I'll be back from annual leave in like March sometime. <laughs> I've got a decent amount of time off to do a whole bunch of admin and work. Like. <laughs> amazing summer series so um yeah I, you can book in to see myself as well but between us three we should be able to help you we absolutely can help you um and yeah I can assure you that our knowledge about the pole dancer's body is going to be um probably a lot better than any other therapists out there that you're seeing that doesn't do pole dancing themselves so um let's make it quicker and safer and um, better for you in the longer term by when the shorter term by seeing a, a therapist that actually knows what they're talking about Anyway, I've gone on another tangent. I'm going to leave it. <laughs> <laughs> I could just talk for way too long as what's shown by the time. Um, we'll wrap it up. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for our, ne our current episode of the uh, summer series. I look forward to seeing you all for our next one. Um, um, make sure you tell your friends and family about the summer series and make sure they sign up um, via the link so they can get access as well. It's free. But no reason why they shouldn't. Um, we'll see you all yep, next Make time. the most of it. Make the most of it. Absolutely. See you all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Danny. <laughs> <laughs>